I'm privileged to welcome and share the stage with two people who represent both an innovative and interesting sector in the food system. Some people, myself included, consider them the rock stars of the food world, and these people are the chefs. Today's modern chef is no longer wearing a stained apron and torn pants. They're not just behind the kitchen, they're at policy events like this one, where they can bring, bring about real change and inform our society. Most importantly, I believe, unlike the traditional actors engaged in the global food system rhetoric, chefs inherently value the human-centered nature of food, the tradition, the knowledge, and the culture it embodies, and most importantly and above all, its interest, its accountability to the interests and preferences of taste. So, eat thought, why don't we utilize this class of, this class of um, culinary professionals to bring about real change and bring them into the spotlight? So last year, EAT hosted a dinner with the four times world best restaurant, Noma, at the United Nations General Assembly. At this dinner, the Australian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Julie Bishop, as you've heard, she announced Launch Food at this dinner. So Launch Food is an open innovation program for innovators and entrepreneurs with big ideas to create lasting change and impact for good health outcomes. So as you've seen, Robert was one such innovator, and we're delighted to have him welcome to the stage today. And additionally, this year, EAT partnered with the Culinary Institute of America to develop the Plant Forward Global 50. Now this list brought together 50 of the world's leading chefs and restaurants who are advancing plant-forward food choices each in their own way. Now, the one Indonesian restaurant to make it onto this list was Bali's infamous Locavore, and we're absolutely delighted to have Ray Adriansa um, join us on stage today. So I'd like everyone to welcome Ray from yes. Locavore and Robert on stage. How's it going? <laughs> Welcome, Ray. Thank you. So, just firstly, can you tell me a bit about your food philosophy and why Indigenous foods are so important, and particularly how this has sort of helped shape the vision for Locavore? Right. Um, let me uh, quickly tell me about uh, tell you guys about my background first. Uh, so, Locavore is a project of uh, three of us: uh, myself, uh, Elke, my really good friend from the Netherlands, and Adi from uh, Bali. Uh, met Elke in Jakarta 10 years ago. Very, very nice restaurants. Uh, super, super fine dining. Um, everything is uh, flown in uh, from uh, chicken from uh, France, uh, lamb from New Zealand, uh, fish from Japan. For me, as a, as a young cook, I was really uh, super happy. You know, oh, cool. You know, um, uh, you know uh, goose liver as well. And then we moved to Bali. Uh, slowly, slowly, we, we work in a, a resort. Uh, and then we sort of realizing that, um, you know, we, we also have a nice stuff here. You know, nice, nice barramundi, uh, nice vegetables, uh, nice, nice, nice fruits, flowers. And then, it's, and then we sort of decided why, why, why bother um, using the um, export uh, produce while we have things here. So, and then we opened Locavore. Uh, Locavore is about um, modern uh, cuisines um, and using uh, produce from Indonesia. Thanks. Um, we focus in um, uh, Balinese uh, produce, uh, but we get um, produce from Java, Sumatra, uh, Lombok. We've had uh, seafood from the, uh, uh, Papua sometimes. And um, yeah, that's, that's, that's about it. Mm. Yeah. And what about you, Robert? So what, what, what is your sort of food philosophy and, and what's the importance for you of using indigenous ingredients and how has that shaped the Pacific Island food revolution? You know, um, I grew up in the Pacific and I didn't really appreciate how great the food was until I lived in New York and lived away. And then you kind of get the astonishment of the onlooker when you go home and you're like, wait a second, we've got this incredible cuisine but no one seemed to know about it. And that had reflected inwardly in the Pacific in that 
Um, we didn't think of our food as cuisine even. Um, we, we didn't see it as, a, as, a, as, as valid as Thai or French or any of those other gastronomic systems that were revered. And I guess my work was to try to raise the status of our food, not just globally, but also for our own view. Yeah. And Ray, I know that 95% um, of your food comes from the local area. So can you tell us a little bit about your environmental policy and also um, the way that you work with and ensure that you have minimal food waste in the kitchen? Um, I, I believe uh, at 95, almost 95% of our ingredients are from uh, locally sourced. Uh, we, we still use a little bit of baking soda, uh, gelatins, um, but we try to make the most of it from uh, the, the local guys. Uh, we directly uh, deal with the local farmers. Uh, we hardly buy from uh, the bigger companies anymore. Uh, we do have uh, wastage uh, systems. Uh, we, raise, we used to raise our own pigs. Uh, we have 12 of them, uh, so all the, all the uh, kitchen scraps, uh, they go to the, to the, to the pigs. Um, then, so we have local work, and then local work to go. Then the butcher, where you know, uh, all about uh, whole lamb, our own pigs. Uh, we make charcuterie and everything. Um, and then, uh, we, yeah, we just we just make make the most of it. So chicken uh, kitchen scraps goes to the uh, pigs, uh, and then we uh, also contribute in the um, locals um, for the wastage as well. Yeah. Nice, fantastic. And Robert, we spoke about this a little bit um, the other day, but what was the, the catalyst and activation that really sort of spurred your, your journey and, and, what, and you know, how did that lead to the Pacific Island food revolution? Um, I wrote my first, I, I decided to put, um, to package up the cuisine of the region so that it could be at least seen and understood. And that was partly originally, because I've been working on the Caribbean, connecting farmers to the hotels, and I realised that local cuisine was the, the, was the draw, was the market. If local food was on the menus and the resorts, yeah. local agriculture was required, not optional. So that was when I started thinking, wow, I've got to do this where I'm from, you know? I'm, I'm from the Pacific and we need this too. So I wrote my first cookbook um, to, to profile the traditional foods, and it was the reaction to the book that, that really opened my eyes because people, didn't just see it as a cookbook, they saw it as a book about them. And it was very validating and acknowledging in a very profound cultural space. And then the book went on to do really well. And so everyone took that in as well. And sort of kick-started your, your work with TED Talks and, and sort of the international community. Yeah. Oh, well, my book, my book won the best cookbook in the world that year. So we beat the New York Times and all these French amazing books. And suddenly, the little Pacific was sitting at the table with these incredible international players. And honestly, it was a wake-up call. There was the response on social media. I, I would never have anticipated it, but it was very heartfelt. And so I've been trying to keep up since then, <laughs> fundamentally. <Yeah. laughs> and Ray, what, sort of, what was your catalyst that sort of sparked your food journey? And, what, and was it inspired by the types of foods you ate as a child? Oh, um, <coughs> we were first open uh, Logovore. Uh, we 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 do uh, yeah, um, still the European uh, food, but using um, local produce. Uh, by, by by locals back then, it was all about you know uh, everything is grown in the area or in Bali, uh, like beetroots and uh, radishes, uh, baby carrots. Uh, all these flowers, the nostril shims and everything. So, and then we sort of decided um, it just doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, so we stopped using the uh, beetroot, the radishes, the strawberries, the raspberries. Um, yeah, for, for, for us it's just, um, I think raspberries is best eaten in Australia or in Europe when they are in best seasons. Um, I totally agree uh, with Robert uh, in the video. Uh, uh, these days, we, we, we use a lot of uh, palm hearts, uh, bamboo in seasons, uh, kangkung, which is a uh, water spinach. Uh, I believe it's the same with, with you as well. So I think that's 
change us a little bit in the in the uh, principles of what we're doing uh, these days. So more into uh, indigenous uh, plants. I mean, I didn't grow up eating beetroot when I was a kid. Um, yeah. And Robert, can you tell us about um, how the Pacific Island Food Revolution intends to promote health and sustainability in the region, and sort of what are the next steps going forward over the next few years? So it's. You know, I do a lot of TV, and what, I did a big show called My Kitchen Rules, which is one of those big, crazy, you know, chef -y, dramatic public shows. And it was a real wake-up call to me because I suddenly realized the influence that, that food and chefs have in public discourse and engagement. And I thought, wow, I've got, this is something, I, and I know that in the Pacific, everybody watches TV. It's the hero communicator. We're not in the digital space yet, right? Everyone watches television. And I thought, I've got it, it's a sweet spot of influence. So, but, but I also knew that it had to be entertainment because actually everyone in the Pacific knows what not to eat and they know what to eat, but we haven't got that will and that excitement and that enthusiasm and that high level narrative in, so that everyone's, everyone's saying, why aren't we doing this? And so that, that's the, almost the revolution, the social movement bit. So, there is a reality television cooking show at the heart of it, because I've seen how they work. But a social movement also means how do you integrate the knowledge and the recipes and the content from the um, experts into everyday life. And there's a whole um, kind of toolkit around other media, other forms of media, but just other forms of engagement, consumer engagement, that elevate this message into real living. Yeah. Oh, definitely. So this is, I guess, this question is for both of you. But how how do we sort of activate chefs sort of across the board, and how how do we change this discourse to make you know plant-based, delicious food more sexy and accessible, <coughs> rather than sort of cheap, fast food? Mm. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it has to come from themselves. Yeah. Um, not getting the, the shortcuts. Um, it's it's for us switching from from the um, local produce from uh, t from the imported to the local produce. It's it's took us quite a while. Uh, all the all the all the phone calls, all the all the searchings, all the creativity, all the because I believe, you know, no offense to anyone, um, getting a beef and a, you have a nice asparagus and maybe a truffles, is already super nice. You know, well, we have to uh, buy a whole pig. We have to uh, work uh, um, sort of, uh, yeah, we, 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 we have to think a little bit harder. I, I believe it, it, it and, and it makes, uh, these days it's, it's, it's just, yeah, sort of uh, in the back of our head. Um, we, of course, we have a, a very good R&D team. Um, I believe it has to come from, from, from the chef itself. And, yeah, sharing and then, for me, I cannot be more proud to serve uh, Indonesian produce. And I think, I think if, <coughs> I believe, you know, if, if, you, if, if you guys, if any of you guys come to uh, Indonesia, you want to taste uh, some uh, local uh, produce. Um, now we start also uh, implementing some local flavors in our cuisines. Uh, we're searching uh, produce from different area in uh, Indonesia. Yeah. I think my role has been about giving chefs the tools the cookbooks, the building the awareness. Like my book, both of my books have done well in Australia and New Zealand, which are the tourism market. So tourists come now with a bit of knowledge around local food. And the chefs, the she I mean, the chefs in Samoa and Fiji and, and Tonga and Vanuatu, they've stepped into the space. I don't need to uh, encourage them. They want to do this. They want to be involved, but they've got to, they've got to do what their customers want as well. So, I mean. For me, it's the, the, the path has been developing the collateral around books and television to build the awareness in the consumer mind yeah. to ask the chefs. And just, it, you know, it's the framework that we all sit within is the narrative that sits locally and also when these, in these islands that are very tourism-based, when the tourists come in saying, I want that, yes. chefs are going to be thrilled. Yeah. They want to cook that way as well. Yeah. yeah, I've got a whole community of chefs that I work with now, yeah. and it's the most collaborative non-competitive group of people I've ever worked with, which is very not like the chef archetype. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
Um, and, and Ray, we were discussing this uh, yesterday, but what was the impetus for you to, to implement a more plant-forward menu in the restaurant? Oh, uh, um, we were super happy. Uh, we, we were <coughs> we, uh, plant forward uh, 50 uh, contacted uh, us this year. I don't know why. <laughs> um, so uh, when we first started uh, Locovore, uh, so, so Locovore has uh, two, two, two menus. We have uh, one we call uh, Locovore, which is uh, your normal menu, where uh, fish and meat are included, and the herbivore, which is vegetable tasting menu. When we were first open, uh, you know, we, we only opened for, only for the, you know, the, the mainstream uh, yeah, menus, uh, which is, yeah. And then we, we always, because being in Ubud, it's always, uh, you have sort of a high demands of uh, yeah, vegetarians coming in, vegans, and then we were we were we were always in troubles when when, when they came in. We, we we came to the tables and then uh, we we asked them, hey, good evening, you know, what 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 can we do for you? We were always always in troubles, and then we we and then we decided we, let, let's do a, let, let's do a vegetable tasting menu. Let's do five courses and seven courses. You know, now some some people they 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 they. they like the vegetable more than the, than the local local for I like the vegetable more sometimes. Um, I, I think cooking vegetables or anything in 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 that, that sort of lines is just uh, it's fun. Yeah, I think I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, and Robert, sort of from our, our previous conversation, we talked about you know creating creating a social movement around this kind of good food. So what what do you think will be the the success that it's going to drive the Pacific Food Island Revolution. How how are we going to generate a big social movement around it? Um, through media, we're, we're we're using entertainment as a vehicle. I mean, it it there's a it's popularising and making it top of mind and moving it into that into that um, where every every absolutely everyone is talking about it. Um, space. I, I believe success will come through that. Mm. Um, I, I believe in the power of glamour, which is one of the reasons I use television. And I think chefs have a role in glamour. We do glamorise the notion of food mm. and move it, you know, you know, I, like my restaurant in Auckland, for example, I, I'm always saying to my chefs, which is a Pacific Island restaurant, they want to come up with things. And I'm saying, what did your grandmother make you? And then st t start from there. So when, I, I think the notion of traditional food is even the term is a bit off-putting for some young people because they think tradition is heavy and bogging you down, but it's actually just a knowledge base and it can be interpreted and made contemporary, as long as you understand the foundation and the principles that sit behind traditional food, which is traditional food as an expression of people and nature. Mm. So you just can't go wrong if you eat traditionally. But it doesn't always have to be the same way. Definitely. And sort of, uh, I think we're sort of ra rounding up in, in a little bit, but I just wanted to put forward, how, how do you think we're going to make vegetables sexy? And, and sort of what are three Three vegetables that you, you can't do without in your kitchen. Um, I can't live without in my life taro leaves. Because <laughs> if you go, I mean, you, you love what you grow up on, right? So taro leaves are, is a big one for me. Also coconut, coconut oil, grated coconut, coconut cream, every, all the thousands of forms that we, <laughs> we love it in the South Pacific. And there are things that, because I live in New Zealand, we're subtropical and we don't have all the same crops as the Pacific Islands, when I go back, to the Pacific, there are things like there's the o'o, which is a sprouting heart of the coconut. And it's just nostalgic and recollective. You know, you, your memories in your self is built on these, on these food memories are very powerful. Listen, the fast food companies understand that really well. Exactly. It it's always changes uh, with me. Uh, these days, I, I like the uh, bean sprouts. Uh, we just did uh, dinner last night with uh, bean sprouts on the menu. Uh, I like um, andaliman papers uh, from northern Sumatra, um, and as yeah, um, bamboo shoots, fresh bamboo shoots. That, that, that's always nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think sort of a, as a final question, you know, uh, Robert, you're doing a fantastic job of getting chefs into sort of the the homes of sort of the everyday in the Pacific Islands, but. How do we ensure that we, we get chefs also within the sort of global food system rhetoric? How do we make sure that you're, you're constantly at events like this and really leading the advocacy charge? Because I think, you know, I, I read a report that said um, people believe in chefs more than they do the government for, for what is a healthy and sustainable diet. So how do we ensure that we sort of utilise the power of chefs and really, and really put them in the spotlight? 
by continuing to invite us to venues such as this. I mean, I, I, I get regularly asked to things like this, but it's taken a long time for us to be viewed beyond the big TV identity or the restaurant identity, because actually we're involved, we're, we're active players in the food chain. We can, we, can, we can create fashion and trends, we can create excitement, and we can make choices and communicate those to our consumers. So we're educators as well. So how do we get, I mean, I, I don't know, I don't have an answer to that, so, but I'm, I'm, I'll go to anything where, yeah. where the conversation can be nurtured and developed amongst a wider community of people who um, can support and care. That's a long question, but I, I, I don't have a, a specific answer. So I, th I think by um, spreading the, 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 the right messages um, to our uh, consumers or, or to our guests or to the people, and for me, um, yeah, using the local produce, it just makes sense. And I think you have to be proud as well. And I, I, I'm proud of what, what, what I'm cooking, and I think the, our guests yeah, should at least give it a try. I think at least you go to restaurants and, and, and go to uh, the local uh, restaurants and maybe by then, you know, hopefully one day, all the, these young chefs and all the restaurants in Indonesia, they start using local produce. And maybe the government, uh, for sure, we, have, we, we need a backup from the, from the, from the government itself, mm. for sure. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, please give a very warm applause for Robert and Ray for joining me on stage. Thank you.